Good morning. Take your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 6. Back this up just a little bit. Microphone not quite so much in my face. (laughs) John 6, this morning, verses 52 to 59. And Lord willing, next Sunday we will conclude the chapter. It is a lengthy one, as you can surmise by the amount of sermons we've done on it. Thought I would give a very sweet title, Do We Really Eat Jesus' Flesh and Drink His Blood? Didn't that just make you all gooey? Put goosebumps on your arm? But but it's a legitimate question. Do we really eat Jesus' flesh and drink His blood? Jesus in John chapter 6 verse 51 said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. We looked at that last week. So did Jesus really mean, as some argue, that when you partake in the Lord's Supper, the bread becomes his literal flesh? The juice or the wine becomes the literal blood of Jesus. Is that what he meant? I mean, we're going to partake in the Lord's Supper at the conclusion of the sermon. So, what was he talking about? We'll get into that, but before we do, let's pray. Father, help us. Lord, we we need you. I know that personally, but even corporately, we need you. Father, help us to realize where we are, not just a a building, but a place dedicated for a congregation of believers to come together and to behold God, to do that through singing and praying and preaching and hearing and partaking in the ordinances. And there's more than that. There's church discipline. There's several aspects, but God, we're not just here. I pray that that's not why we're here. That we're not just going through motions. But that we really are here to hear from you. For those who are saved, God, we need you to do the sanctifying work that you promised to do. Instead of grumbling about it, Lord, make us joyful as we talked about that last week too. Fill me with your power, I pray so that I can preach in a manner that you are pleased with, that the body of Christ is edified by, that the unbeliever will hear and actually know, I need this great God, and that they will hear that this great God will save. You are that great saving God. So for your glory, I preach. Lord, help us now to worship you in the sermon. Amen. The Bread of Life discourse given at the synagogue in Capernaum began back in verse 25 of this chapter. And it will conclude in verse 58, as we will get to this morning. But before we dive into today's text, I want to remind you that in this particular snapshot, I think that's how I would title this series, Snapshots of Jesus' Divinity. Why? Because you have that prologue in chapter 1 of the introduction of John the Baptist, but then in chapters 2 through 4, that's... They're not the same event, but they're closely related in time. There's a snapshot of his divinity as God who's over nature, God who goes to the Samaritans. In chapter 5, that's one Sabbath day in the midst of a bunch of time. It's a snapshot of Jesus uh, claiming to be divine. And even the audience said, that's why we want to kill you, because you make yourself out to be God. Well, sometime later, chapter 6, another snapshot over a two-day period. We're about to get into a section from 7, chapter 7, 8, and 9 at the Feast of Booths, another snapshot, and so on and so on. So I, I do, I think that's how I would title the entire study of John, Snapshots of Jesus' Divinity. But what is the snapshot here? He is claiming to be the greater manna, the true manna, not like the manna in Exodus that was given to provide Uh, for physical needs, physical hunger, but the manna that will satisfy the soul eternally. He says, I'm that bread. You want bread to fill your stomach, you need bread to fill your soul. And manna won't do that. I do that. God the Father has sent me into the world, and all who come to me in faith, I will give eternal life. And I will raise you up at the end. 
What great promises. And Jesus emphasized that point in this discourse. But his audience, like other audiences before this one, have missed his point. So now he's going to use a very strong metaphor to back up his point as to what he's been saying. Come to me and live. Come to me. Believe me as the one sent from God the Father into the world who will give his life for you. So what he's saying in these verses is not uh, different than what he's been saying. He's just, he's painting a picture by it. In the back and forth between Jesus and the Jews at the Capernaum synagogue, and there has been a back and forth. They've grumbled, they've argued. Jesus has just said something there in verses 50 and 51 that is leading to a point of conflict amongst those Jews in the crowd. Now, although I do not think, and I want you to hear me on this, I do not think that the primary emphasis of this paragraph, verse 52 to 59, I the emphasis is the Lord's Supper. I think Jesus alludes to it, but I don't think that's the primary point. And if you're wondering, well, why are we doing the Lord's Supper? Any Sunday is a good Sunday to do the Lord's Supper. But there is the alluding to it. I, I want to touch on this for a moment. Yeah, what's the main point? Jesus is the bread of life. Come to me and live. But in Roman Catholic theology, as it pertains to the Lord's Supper, or what they would call the Eucharist, they, they have a doctrine that is called transubstantiation. And the idea is that in giving the Eucharist, the bread is blessed and becomes the flesh of Jesus. So when you eat the bread, you're eating the flesh of Jesus. And the wine becomes the blood of Jesus. So when you drink from the cup, you drink in his blood. That's what they think. Now Lutherans, uh, Martin Luther would have held to this view, hold to a view called consubstantiation. Transubstantiation, tran in, con, with. So Lutherans would say, well, he is with us in this, but we're not actually eating his flesh and drinking his blood. In Southern Baptist convention congregations and, and even many Protestant churches, it is typically understood that those who partake in the Lord's Supper are baptized believers, recognizing Christ's presence with his people, but that we are not eating his literal flesh or drinking his literal blood. This would be more of the view of a theologian that I follow there, Ulrich Zwingli. I'm sure many of you have heard of him, right? And he's only a few centuries old. Uh, well, he's not that old now. Um, but the Zwingli position is the one that I hold to. And I'm glad you know that. I feel better that I've told you. So let's dive into the text this morning, verses 52 to 59, and we'll start in verse 52 on this subtitle, Eating Jesus' Flesh and Drinking His Blood. First of all, we're going to see that there is division amongst the Jewish crowd at the words of Jesus. Look at verse 52 of John 6. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying... How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So they've turned their grumbling away from Jesus, and now there's a debate amongst themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? From grumbling in the prior paragraph, where they're grumbling with Jesus, now they're debating each other. The grumbling of the Jews toward him in verse 41 has now become discord amongst themselves. So that tells us that some people are, are, are hearing the same words but thinking differently on them. We, we know that right there from, from the nature of, of what John just wrote. But the issue of division is from the words of Jesus in verses 50 and 51, wherein he claimed to be the bread from heaven that must be eaten so as to have eternal life. And he also said that I'm the bread that, that, that you're going to eat, my flesh. So the Jews seem to think that Jesus is speaking of some type of cannibalism. That's what's going on. That's why this is perplexing. Now, is that his point? No. Let's think back to the Gospel of John. When Nathaniel first heard, and I'm going to come back to Nathaniel, when he first heard 
that the Messiah has come, what was Nathaniel's response? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? <laughs> well, I'm here, Nathaniel. But then you go into chapter 4 with the Samaritan woman. Give me a drink. Why are you a Jew asking me, a Samaritan, for water? And Jesus said, if you knew who you were talking to, you would ask me for water that will quench your thirst forever. Oh, give me that water. No, you, you're missing my point. You think I'm talking about water from a well. I'm talking about I am the water. So Jesus is dealing with this constantly. And let's not forget, even amongst the, the 12, they don't get his point a lot of the time, right? There's an event wherein Jesus says, I'm about to go to Jerusalem, and I will be handed over. I will be mistreated. I will be crucified. They're, they're going to kill me, but I'm going to rise. And you want to know what the 12 are arguing about? Which one of us will be the greatest? Even the 12 right there with Jesus would not only miss his point, but sometimes ignore it completely. Folks, that's a warning for us, right? You can hear sermon after sermon, whether they be good or not, I do not know. But if we're not careful, you can miss the point. I, when I am studying, can miss the point. Sometimes I go back and look at notes from sermons I have preached when I was at South Whitwell and even before that. And I almost cry. I'm like, how did I miss the point that bad? And you say, were the sermons heretical? Well, no, there wasn't doctrinal heresy. And, and the points that I would give in the sermons were not necessarily awful, but the sermons were heavily uh, about application, but missing the point of the text. I think I've shared this with you. John MacArthur, Dr. John MacArthur, he's one of my favorites as far as preachers. But he said while he was in seminary, um, he's preaching a sermon and his mentor is there on the stage. That's kind of how they do it at the seminary level. And, and afterwards, uh, Dr. MacArthur asked him, he said, uh, well, what do you think? He said, well, John, I tell you what, you had an incredible, incredible uh, outline and your points were succinct and they flowed one to the next. You had a good delivery. And other than missing the point of the text, you did great. <laughs> Other than missing what God is telling us, you did fine, son. Folks, I have preached to where that could be said of me, and I know that's still being done. I pray that those of us who actually claim to be called of God to preach will get very serious about the study of the Word before we think about preaching the Word. Preaching is not an easy task but because you must wrestle with God to get at what he's saying. This crowd has heard from Jesus. They just came from the other side of the Sea of Galilee the day before, Sea of Galilee the day before, and they have eaten of the loaves and the fish. But when he is teaching them, they are missing the point. I want you to take this from, from point one for your own deliberations with people, if you will. Always be uh, respectful and gracious, please, as much as you can. You might have noticed that in our country there's a little bit of division. Um, if you tell someone that you're a Republican and they're a Democrat, uh, they might not like that. Or if you tell someone you're a Democrat and they're a Republican, they might not like that. I don't know. I mean, I, I could be just, you know, grasping at straws there. Tell someone that you follow Jesus and that He is the only way and there are no other saviors. That, that might bring some contention, right? So expect people to be divided over who Jesus is and what He did and what He said. Expect that from the start. And it can come in several forms. Some just flat out reject that the Bible is even true. We don't even know if Jesus was a real person. And then those who will say, well, he was a real person, but he's not God. He's, he's more of an idea. He, he's, he's a good guy. And, and you know what? He, he's a good prophet. Well, he claimed to be the only way. So if, if he's what you're saying, he's a liar. <laughs> Some people just flat out reject what the Bible says. But then others try to take Jesus' words and make them mean something other than what they mean. There are those who would say, well... In fact, I, I just heard this recently in a sermon that I was listening to. There were some in the Jesus movement that said, we will take the words of Scripture, and if they cannot fit into the metric of love, then we will say those were not his words. Now, I don't know who got the authority to come up with that metric. There, there's a question to ask. 
Yeah, anything that Jesus says about judgment or hell, no, that can't be from Jesus. Says who? Well, says us. Says, says we. I just said us and we just in case I got it half right. I got it half wrong. I'll find out later. Um, but the words of Jesus are the words of Jesus. And people are divided over them. So expect that. But even when people are divided over his words, do what Jesus did and keep sharing them. You might have to leave a particular individual or a particular group and move on. That does happen. Sometimes you will encounter what I call dishonest skeptics, and that's not original to me. I'm borrowing that from others. People who really don't want to know, they just like to debate, pick fights, and get mean, and get on Twitter and be mighty warriors. But then there are people who like to say, man, are these things true? Are these really true? Did Jesus really claim to be God and back up those claims? I'm all ears. You'll, you'll meet those people too. So expect people to be divided, but graciously continue to give the word of God. That's point one. Now, point two covers most of our paragraph this morning, verses 53 to 58. You would think Jesus backs down. Not only does he not back down, he does what he did back in chapter 5. He ups the ante. He pushes harder. Look at verse 53. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, that's key, and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Verse 56, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the, the fathers ate, or the manna, and died, whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus pushes his point even more. I am the only bread that can give eternal life to you. The bread I gave you yesterday lasted but a few hours and you're wanting more already. That's your physical hunger. That's fine. We, we, we have physical needs. Jesus, in his humanity, needed to eat. Because my point is that there's a bread that you need that meets far more than your physical need. It meets the spiritual need that you can never meet for yourself. And that no one other than me can meet for you. He responds in verse 53 to the crowd with these words, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Now that key phrase there, Jesus identifies Himself as the Son of Man. He's already claimed to be God, to be sent from God, and to be God, to be divine. And now He is speaking here of His, of his humanity. Son of Man sometimes was used by the Jews to refer to the Messiah. Not all, but, but some. Jesus uses this title for himself back in chapter 1 with Nathaniel. I told you I would come back to him. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth, Nathaniel? The Son of Man is here. In John chapter 3, remember that conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus in Jerusalem during Passover? I'm the Son of Man. Nicodemus, being the teacher of Israel, though lost at the time, would have understood what Jesus was driving at. In chapter 5, on that Sabbath day during Passover, Jesus heals a man who had been paralyzed for 38 years. He wasn't born that way, but he had gotten to that condition. But Jesus heals him on a Sabbath, tells him, take up your bed and walk, which broke one of the additional laws that the Jews made, not that God made. And he tells them, I'm the son of man. They, they say, we want to kill you because you make yourself out to be God. We've seen that. And even in this discourse, back in verse 27, 
This is what happened. Jesus said, Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on Him God the Father has set His seal. So you come back there to verse 53. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, I'm the Son of Man, and drink His blood, you don't have life. Nicodemus didn't have it. At least not then. And he was the teacher of Israel. The man that the religious Jews looked to and said, this is who you want to be taught by. And Jesus says, you don't know me. You don't know God. Until you believe me, you don't know me. But when you believe me, I know you and you know me. In verse 54, he says a very similar thing, but he gives a different, different angle. Those who feed and drink of Jesus have eternal life, and there's the promise, and I will raise him up on the last day. We've seen that multiple times in this discourse. Jesus said earlier, all who the Father gives to me will come to me. I won't cast out. I'll keep them, and I'll raise them on the last day. I will do it. He comes back to that here. You feed and drink upon me and you will have eternal life and I will raise you. In verse 55 is an explanation and a contrast. Jesus' flesh and blood gives true satisfaction to the soul eternally, whereas physical food and drink can only provide temporal provisions meeting physical needs. Folks, how are we like those Jews? We are a lot like them still. Even those of us who know him still have that inkling to run back to meet my physical needs, Lord. And we miss the communion with him, our God and our King and our Savior. Does God meet physical needs? Yes. But does he meet those needs so that we will enjoy the needs or enjoy him? So if your needs are being met but you're missing Jesus, guess what? You're missing the point of why he's meeting the need. In verse 56, those who feed on Jesus' flesh and drink His blood abide in Him. They remain in Him, and He in them. Jesus keeps those who belong to Him. I've said it just moments ago. I say it again. All whom the Father gives to me will come to me, and I will not cast them out, and I will raise them on the last day. Does that sound like a, a Savior who securely saves his people now I didn't say recite these words with some emotion in your heart and have no change and you're saved no I didn't say that neither did Jesus I want to tell you again I believe that when a sinner is rescued by God they are eternally secure but you will be able to tell if they know God or not and the person who says, yeah, I prayed a prayer 30 years ago, but I am no different and don't want to be different. Friend, you uttered some words into the air and they did nothing for your soul. Nothing. You believe Jesus. You abide. This is ongoing. You remain. He remains with you. In verse 57, Jesus shows that this eternal life is rooted in none other than God Himself. He says, the Father lives, so the Son lives. And those who feed on the Son will live. Why? Because of God. Not because of you and your performance, but because of Him. Verse 58, Jesus again speaks of Himself as that bread that came from heaven to give eternal life. Whereas these Jews in the crowd had already brought up the point about God giving manna, or rather Moses giving manna to the Israelites who came out of Egypt in the Exodus, Jesus goes, nope, you're missing it. I'm the true manna. And Moses didn't give it to you. He said that earlier in the discourse. My Father gives the true bread. And you don't have to keep going and getting it each day, each morning. Because you have the true bread and you never lose Him and He never loses you. I'm that bread. Well, I don't know that manna. I read about it. And it sounds like it tasted pretty good. Well, I've read that too. You might, might be able to surmise I'm a bread lover. And bread loves me back so much that it doesn't like to leave me. I love bread. But they got tired of it. I have a feeling I would too, even as a bread lover. 
what convicts my heart is that I now know the difference and I have tasted of the true manna. And there are times when I will do much grumbling rather than rejoicing in him. And I'm so much like that crowd of unbelieving Jews. I know I preached this in a prior sermon and April has to call me out on it because unfortunately I, I seem to be gifted with grumbling. A grumble, grumbling reveals what, where my heart is. It's the same for you. I don't feel like going to Grace Fellowship. The building will be too hot. Or maybe it'll be too cold. It's never just right. Last week, he was cold and she was hot. I don't like the songs they sang. That preaching, my goodness, does it really take more than 20 minutes? Yes, it does. Well, I heard a guy that preached in 20 minutes. Here's my advice. Don't listen to him again. Grumbling, complaining. Just like them. Because sometimes I forget. I have tasted of the true manna. The manna that has satisfied my soul. Oh, that God will restore me to joy in Him. Jesus, you are the true bread that has come from heaven better than the manna that was given. It was good bread. It, it met the needs, but it was pointing to the true bread, the greater manna. That's who you are, Jesus. So as far as an application point of, of this to my family and Jesus, rejoice and keep rejoicing. Why? You know God and He knows you. And He will never lose you. He will never forsake you. And no matter how bad life is seeming and how high prices get and, and the turmoil in your life, those things are true and they're realities, but nothing or no one can separate you from Him or Him from you. Rejoice and keep rejoicing. And if Jesus is all you have, you're going to find out He's all I've ever really needed anyway. And I'm going to give an application to the unbeliever. No, we're not done. We've got one more point to go. Come to this bread. Come to Jesus. Believe Him. And He will give you Himself. He will give you eternal life. That's the only application I can give to the unbeliever. Come to Jesus. Come. Believe. And let's conclude with the last verse. Verse 59. Point three. Jesus taught these things publicly. Verse 59, Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. Jesus plainly stated to be sent here from God. He plainly stated that to have eternal life, you must come to him in faith. Jesus, here it is, was not saying that you actually eat his flesh and drink his blood. No, I do not think he was. I think that for those in the Roman Catholic Church, I think they are using this paragraph and not looking at the, the ones before it. Where Jesus has said, the Father has given some to me, they will come to me, I'll save them, I'll keep them, I'll raise them. But, but what is this? You're believing me. That's how you have eternal life. You're believing me. He's just using a stronger metaphor now. It's not, a, it's not different. But no, you don't have to hope that the bread becomes his flesh and that the wine becomes his blood. You, that, that doesn't have to happen here, folks. That's not the picture. The picture is believe and he will save you. Now, some might think that Jesus should have concluded his discourse by accommodating to the crowd and making it easier to accept. Because that's our world. If, if you say something hard, well, you've got to soften it. Jesus didn't. Well, maybe more people would come if your preaching was softer. I'm not saying that there's never a place for softness. But sound doctrine is difficult to, to hear and endure. The Bible tells us that. So part of my task is laboring in the Word 
to discover the doctrine, to present the doctrine to you, knowing, Lord, this is going to be hard to hear, but this is how you teach. And, and let's think about it, folks. Are you glad that you didn't stay at the first grade level of education in your learning? Well, we don't want to push them too hard. No, you advance to the next grade. Courses get a little tougher. Then you advance to the next. Gets a little tougher, right? That's the natural progression. You would think, well, Jesus, if you're going to keep these people, you need to keep this big crowd, so you better soften up. And Jesus goes, not a chance. I'm about to make it tougher. But you have to come back to something I've already mentioned two times. But back in verse 37, this is absolutely solid. Jesus, are you not worried that if, if, if you don't soften your tone, make it a little easier to digest, that people aren't going to be saved? Let me tell you something. All that the Father gives to the Son will come to the Son. Not might, they will. And all of those I will not cast out. I will keep and I will raise. So no, I'm not worried at all and neither should you be. Folks, hear my heart. I know that sometimes I'm rough. Uh, I get that. I listen to my sermons. It's painful. You all keep showing up. So I'm going to keep coming back and doing it again and again until you don't. There's a place for, for softness. There really is. But I don't know if you've noticed the world we're living in, they're not playing soft anymore. They're not being casual in their opposition to Christianity. They're upping their game. I'm not talking about getting swords and duking it out. But what I'm telling you is this. The idea that meekness means you just lay down and get trampled on is not what Jesus meant that's not what he was talking about. There's a time for the sword. And I'm not, again, I'm not talking about let's go out and hack people up, but there's a time to stand up and say, no, no, that's not what the Word of God says. This is what it says. Well, you better be more inclusive. No, God didn't tell me to do that. Jesus claims to be the only way. You do with that whatever you will do, but that's what he said, and that's what he meant. Well, you're not going to have as many people as that church. That's not on me. Paul talks about ministers, pastors, having to give an account for the people they led. And there's, there are pastors that I'm convinced are going to think, man, I'm going to ride into glory with where I preach to thousands and thousands of people. And God's going to say, I don't know who you are. You didn't tell them the truth. Take a cue from Jesus. Speak publicly, boldly, truthfully, and graciously. But do not surrender sound doctrine in the hopes that you will gain an audience. Because that's not how you want to gain an audience, folks. People do not need to hear that Jesus is a casual guy who can give them a better life and you can go live in fairyland for eternity. People need to understand that there is a God who is holy and who made us in His image and that we have sinned against that holy God and we rightfully deserve judgment. And we will get that. But God has sent His Son into the world to do for sinners what they could not do for themselves. And He hung on a cross, as Craig mentioned earlier, to give His body, His satisfactory sacrifice where the Father is pleased. But Jesus didn't get to the, to the cross easily and without blood. It was messy and gory and painful and he died a horrific death and was put in the ground dead and God raised him. Well, but I'm okay. No, none of us are okay. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and Jesus Christ is your only hope. Believe him and live. Reject him and you will not know life. You will not. We have to be up front, folks. To my family in Jesus, take heart that God has spoken truthfully and is forever trustworthy. We never have to wonder, will God keep His word? I know we doubt Him sometimes, but we never have a legitimate reason to doubt God because He's always truthful and trustworthy. 
to my family in Jesus. You have come to the Son, and He has given you eternal life, and He will keep it for you. Now let's go tell people who He is. Let's go tell them the wonderful news of, of God and His saving plan and what He did to save. Expect opposition. But remember that Jesus had opposition too. And He made it clear, the Father has given me people who will come. God has saved, God is saving, and God will save. We know that God is going to save His people, right? I don't have to evangelize one. Well, I hope I get this right. No, I'm going to share the good news of God and God will save His people. I know that because that's what He says. And to any unbeliever, Jesus spoke to crowds who wanted Him to soften His tone, but He didn't mince His words. He didn't claim to be merely a way to God, but the only way to God. And you will either take Him at His word or you'll believe someone else. There is no middle ground with this. If you do not want eternal life, I pray that God will change that and give you a desire for it. But if you do want eternal life, I have the best news you could ever hear. You can have it. But there's only one door, only one way. It is by faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone. So to you, I simply say, come. Come and believe the Lord Jesus and receive eternal life. Let's pray. Father, help us as we are now going to have to take thought of these words. Some difficult, uh, uh, obviously difficult. But uh, Lord, as we get ready to partake in the Lord's Supper, we are grateful that Jesus is the greater manna and that His blood has been poured out that sinners will be forgiven. We need that. If there's no sacrifice of Jesus, then I'm still in my sins. If Jesus isn't raised from the dead, I'm still in my sins. Oh God, help us. Help us as we partake in the Lord's Supper to continue in worship and praise unto the Lamb of God who was slain to rescue sinners. This I pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen.